This video is brought to you by Squarespace. It's not a Boeing 747. It's not an Airbus A380. Bigger than both, this extreme passenger transport was planned to carry over a thousand passengers, entire train cars with cargo still on board, and even liquid petroleum gas, which it would use as its own fuel supply. It's the perfect blend of Western engineering and post-Soviet Russian ingenuity. It's the incredible and positively insane Sukhoi KR-860. You might have seen this plane before and you might have seen this video before. That's right, it's the 200,000 subscriber special video and we're going back to the root of where it all began without the deep bass. This is the KR-860. But the story of this legendary aircraft doesn't start in Russia or some spy going over 747 blueprints, but rather at the Paris Air Show in 1999. This was a very special year as aircraft firms were debuting the latest and greatest in aircraft designs to tackle the increasing problem of airport congestion. Airports could only take so many aircraft per day and issued airlines limited slot pairs, a single landing and takeoff per week. Some airports were even full, like New York's JFK and London's Heathrow, resulting in auctions for slot pairs at stunning eye-watering prices. So how could this problem be solved? One answer was bigger aircraft. Naturally, both Boeing and Airbus threw their hats into the ring with the Boeing 747X and the Airbus A380, both of which you can check out here on the channel. But it's a third contender that is frankly the coolest. The Sukhoi KR-860. Sukhoi Design Bureau is more famous for its military fighters and attack aircraft throughout the Cold War and in modern day Russia. But this wasn't the first time that they strayed into crazy aircraft territory, having worked before on the somewhat famous T-4 bomber project and the less famous but even more impressive T-4MS. KR stands for Krylia Rasi, which in English is Wings of Russia, and 860 refers to the total number of passengers that this aircraft was built to carry, which was more than both the Western competitors could boast. The idea was for the plane to come in three variants. The first was your standard passenger version that could carry 860 passengers across two levels in three classes or over a thousand if the whole aircraft was in economy configuration. This 800 figure didn't really take into account today's version of business as back then they never really imagined lie flat beds or even entire private suites like on board the A380. But there was still would have been plenty of more room on board for more passengers. The second type of aircraft was your standard freighter version. But unlike other designs thrown around the era, it could carry full containers, as in the containers you see on boats and the back of trains without being deloaded. There was even a rumor that the train cars themselves would be loaded into the aircraft without coming off the tracks. Wouldn't that be a sight? The third type was a liquid petroleum gas variant, and this is the variant that would have been most interesting for Russia itself. What's bonkers about this design is that the aircraft would have been able to tap the gas whilst in flight to power the engines. Technology which was also researched and experimented on for the Tupolev Tu-206. This would mean that the plane could effectively fly for free by sipping away on its cargo. But even more importantly for Russia, it would connect its remote gas fields with the rest of the country or export it because building pipelines in extreme temperatures and terrains can be even more expensive. The specs listed at the Paris Air Show were bonkers, and the real aircraft would have been 80 meters long with a wingspan of 88 meters, with the wing tips themselves folding up to allow access to airport gates, much like today's Boeing 777X. 
Compared to the Boeing 747 and Airbus A380, the aircraft was over 12 meters longer than the 747 and 15 meters longer than the A380, so it was positively huge. It would have been powered with either GE engines, Pratt & Whitney, or with eight Kuznetsov NK93 engines. It would have a range of around 15,000 kilometers, which is 8,099 nautical miles for my North American friends. But if trains on board wasn't nutty enough, we have to talk about the escalators. Yes, that's right, escalators with an S, because there are three. The KR-860 might be flying today if the Russians had better marketing compared to the Boeing 747 and the Airbus A380. Better marketing like using a Squarespace website. If you're an aerospace giant or even just someone with a business or starting a new venture, then Squarespace is the best tool in your belt. Their sites are already optimized for mobile phones and they have a fantastic e-commerce tech built into their framework, getting you into business right away. Plus, they have all the SEO tools that you need to appear on the front page of Google or whatever the Russians were using back in the future year of 1999. Trust me, Squarespace is the best. To launch your own site, go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first site and domain. On board the passenger version, there would have been two main decks. The lower, wider deck would have had passengers arranged in a 12 abreast seating configuration with three aisles, a first for commercial aircraft. The upper deck would have had a more commonplace nine seats abreast with two aisles. With a load of a thousand passengers on board, the aircraft would need a way to unload them quickly and effectively at airports, like using escalators. But here's the thing, the aircraft didn't expect the airport to provide the escalators, they actually carried them on board. The aircraft design had three escalators built into the hull, one at the front of the aircraft, one at the middle, and one at the end that quickly transported passengers either on or off, whilst at the same time using up to three jet bridges. So where exactly did Sukhoi imagine that this giant plane would fly? The company that was making the aircraft believed that the plane would be perfect for hub-to-hub -hub travel. Think Emirates, but on steroids, and would focus it towards the Asian and Middle Eastern markets. We can't say for sure if it would have been fuel efficient for domestic routes in populous countries like China or India, but it definitely would have been a sight to see. So with an aircraft that ticked all the needs for airlines, and a massive growing passenger population, and multiple industrial needs, why did this giant never take flight? The original specifications of the program said that there would be 300 of these aircraft produced. Thus far, Airbus has only sold 251 Airbus A380 aircraft before the end of the project, and we can propose that a Russian A380 outselling the European counterpart is more than a little bit unrealistic. But in the end, like many things, it's all about money. The concept for the aircraft began in the 1990s with a forecast program cost of around 10 billion US dollars, or in today's money, 15 billion, and called for the first aircraft to be built before the year 2000. Mind you, this is also at an estimated price point of around 150 to 200 million US dollars. Considering that it cost Airbus 25 billion US dollars over 15 years to make the A380, we know that a real cost would have been much higher. In fact, an Airbus A380 costs around 440 million US dollars per unit. The Russian version was impossibly cheap. Sohoi knew this and asked for financial help from China and India, as well as the Russian government, to build it. Because India and China would have been the primary operators of the type and that the aircraft would see little action within Russia itself, the Russian government diverted the funds to other projects in 2001. In the end, Sohoi would only debut a smaller static 124th model to showcase their concept and raise awareness, but the aircraft never saw the light of day. What would have the world been like had this been made? Would we be riding escalators around? Are natural gas transported in the air itself? 
we can only look to the skies and imagine. And speaking of imagination, who could have ever thought that this humble little wannabe pilot would ever make it to the YouTube big time with 200,000 subscribers? I truly could have not reached this milestone without you, yes you, watching right now. And here's to the next 200,000. Plus, I also have to mention that I stand on the shoulders of giants. A special thanks to my team, Jared, June, Ognian, and Andre, who graciously helped to make the 3D model that you see here today. And lastly, once again, it's time to thank my Patreons. Special shout out to the longest serving Patreons on the channel. Gana, Troy, Chris, David, Anti Carrot, Robert Kappa, Luna, Larry, Big Bada Boom, Travis L. Brown, Logla, Big Dan, Nicholas Buta, Baba Conway, and Marco Mangen. If you would like to join this honorable list of Found and Explained supporters, then I've got a link down in the description to go straight to my Patreon, where you'll be able to see videos early, talk to me directly, and even give suggestions for the next topic. I can't wait to see you in the next video.